I made a dead body once on on Grantchester because they wanted someone pulling uh, a body on a gurney out of a out of a house, and I created an entire because we didn't have a a mannequin or anything like that. So I used random bits I could find on my truck, like rolled up tarps, a pair of wellies, and I fashioned this. I modelled it on the actor as well. I had him lie down and I built it around him and created this fake body. And then I saw it on the show when it aired last year and I was like, that's a really good body. I did that and I was really proud of that. And the director came up to me and was like, you really got us out of the lurch there. Welcome to Filmmaking Framed, your video podcast interviewing industry professionals to find out about the realities of filmmaking. With us today is George Price, standby props on projects like Midsummer's Murders and Grantchester. Great to have you with us, George. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me on, guys. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> so could you define for us the role of standby props? Okay, so standby props can be defined in one way of... I give people who have Oscars the information on how to hold a cup. Um, <laughs> no, but it's, it's basically anything that an actor uses within a scene, um, any object they uh, use, uh, break, write with, uh, fight with, a lot of the time is managed by me and my team uh, of other props. Um, but also any furniture or anything that's dressed into a scene, um, because a lot of the times the interior sets you have of people's houses um, we have stripped everything out of that and replaced with our own stuff to fit the design brief and the director's intentions. And then within the filming time, it's our job to manage everything there as well. So if they go, we want to put a camera over there, but there's a sofa there, it's down to myself and the standby team to move that stuff out safely and also to protect the uh, house of the person that we're filming in, basically, similar to locations department. We we definitely work very closely with you guys. <laughs> yeah, we like the locations department. <laughs> there is an eternal tug of war over who should hold the keys to a house if the actor puts the key in the door. Oh, don't. <laughs> I always I always opt for, can we just mime it? Because then we can use our keys and I don't have to take them from you. And they get handed to an AD who gets handed to a runner. And before you know it, these keys no longer exist. Yeah, and you're, you're trying to track back. So yeah. <laughs> who had these keys? Yeah, you need to have like a big like... Like the big toilet sign thing where they have a giant lump of wood on it. So it's like, right, you want the keys, but you've got to hold this giant bit of wood. And you go, oh, suddenly you don't want to hold them anymore. Yeah. I wonder if we could uh, explore props even more. So there's obviously the standby props, which is mm -hmm. what you do. There's dressing props, yep. prop masters, prop buyers, etc. Yeah. cetera. It was a breakdown <laughs> on the whole department. It's, yeah, wow. it's a huge question. But is... if you could kind of talk about, uh, let's start from the sort of junior levels. Because okay. this is, like I say, we aim this podcast at... Uh, people looking to enter the industry. Mm -hmm. So say they're looking to enter props. What are the junior levels? And then maybe we can work our way up from there. Okay, so the props team sort of comes under the branch of the art department. But in most departments on a film set, there is a sort of singular hierarchy, like a ladder style structure, whereas the art department is more like a tree. So it branches out into multiple directions and, both, and sort of sub departments. So if you have the onset team, that are directly with the active film crew. They are the standby team. So you would have a standby prop. You would usually have on smaller productions, you'd have one or you could have two members. So you have your first man, second man. And then you also have um, trainees. You can have juniors. Uh, it all depends on the scale of the production of whether you're given a large team to work with, with lots of trainees and juniors involved, but also you'd have a primary standby on set. With dressing props, you can you can have most people are just referred to as dressing props because it's quite a, a level hierarchy with that but you would have charge hand dressing props who are in charge of the dressers on the scene they are the prop master's representation while they're dressing because obviously the prop master can't be at every set at once that they're managing so they send charge hands or supervising dressing props or supervising standbys there's a lot of titles in our department um, and it all depends on the scale of the production so as an entry level position you would start as if you wanted to work directly with the film crew in, in the sort of eye of the storm, as it were, you would be a trainee standby prop. So you're, you'd go in that you didn't, you don't need a crazy amount of experience to do that because it is an entry level position, but obviously you should be able, you should be quite practically minded. You should have a rough ability of how to use uh, power tools a lot of the times. Cause you will have to, I mean, we basically bodge stuff. So it looks right. So it would look great but it won't necessarily last for ages. So you need to like hang a picture up really quickly and you just ne need to be able to move quickly and efficiently and safely, most importantly. Um, 
So you can be a trainee uh, standby prop, but then also if you wanted to go into the more making sets, like set design in a certain way, you can go in as a uh, trainee dressing prop. So you wouldn't work directly with the crew. You might have a little bit of a overlap between when they're filming. So dressing props tend to work a day or two on on something like Midsummer Murders or Grantchester, which I, I work on. Um, they would work a couple of days in advance either side. So they would dress the set, the crew would arrive, shoot it. Then a couple of days later, the team would go in and remove everything and reinstate it like we were never there. And then we liaise with the locations department and tell them all the stuff that they broke. Um, <laughs> and that is a lie. <laughs> um, Dear listeners. <laughs> um, yeah, and then when you have the art department itself, who are based usually at the production office of of the production team, um, you have a art department assistant who, again, their roles would include uh, basic graphic design, basic prop sourcing, um, and assisting the uh, art director and the designer who is the head of the art department, so sort of everyone's overall boss within the art department. Um, and yeah, it's sort of those are the three sort of main facets of the initial branch out from the bottom of the tree, as it were. Um, but there are also ways to do you can have slightly different jobs where you go slightly above that depending on your level of experience. But yeah, those are the sort of three, I'd say the main ones to go into as the first door you go into as it were. And, and while we're on it, mm -hmm. we, we did usually save this question for later, but mm. if you were looking to get one of those three jobs, mm -hmm. how would someone start that process? How could they find those jobs? You know, where do they like, what resources do they need? Yeah. Um, at the moment, uh, there seems to be a, a, real surge in social media uh, employment within the art department. So there are um, film and TV art department Facebook groups that you can use. There's also WhatsApp groups that you can, once you've maybe worked one or two jobs at a lower level, be it on commercials or something like that, someone can introduce you to that path and sort of vouch for you in a way. And then once you're in there, it's a frenzy. It's like a, it's a lot of time, it's like a tank of piranhas. But you can, if you're, you know, strong-willed enough, you can pick out certain jobs and get into there. Um, Those sort of things, you have to be pretty fast. Oh, so, yeah, So absolutely. if someone posts a job in one of these WhatsApp groups, you have to be, have a CV accurate and ready. 30 seconds. And then send it. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it, it's very quick. They'll go, okay, position filled. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah. you see it an hour later and you go, yeah. oh. Yeah, sometimes it comes in the same minute and you're like, how has someone <laughs> responded that fast? But it is, it is a very, very competitive uh, department. And if you know the person you've got a relationship with them, call them. Oh yeah, absolutely. Networking is, so as you mentioned in one of your previous episodes, networking is so crucial. But it's also, it's not just networking for the sake of trying to get jobs. It's just remain in contact with people that you work with. Maintain those professional relationships um, and personal relationships you have because it's a very friendly industry a lot of the time. Um, and you can build such great friendships with people and just maintaining communication with people is key. Like, don't sort of, if you go away for a bit, you can, like, if you don't talk to people for like a month, you can be replaced very easily because the second you leave, there are three people that want to fill your position and will do it quicker, faster and cheaper. Like, it's it's very, very competitive. So keep your network tight, keep talking to people and communication is key. Definitely. I was wondering that one thing I've seen, which I don't think we've covered on the podcast yet, but mm. one thing that can be challenging if you're building those relationships is is if you're already on a job. Mm. So, because you, obviously you want to keep as many relationships going as possible, sure. but as you say, you can very quickly get replaced by oh, yeah. by someone else. So, sometimes you might feel the, the uh, you want, basically what you want to do is stick with one person because you're like, mm. I'll just stick with this one person and keep going on every job they do. Yeah. But then you, you put yourself at risk of that person deciding to take six months off oh, or yeah. Definitely. You, and you being forgotten by everyone else. So, yeah. how do you balance that that sort of that, that conflict that is that is one of the hardest things within within the art department is is you get comfortable with certain like prop masters like i've worked with two or three that are, are really dear to me and they're very good friends like some of them are even invited to my wedding like i'm and you you get very comfortable with their jobs because they sort of seek out the same sort of genre same sort of time frame um like i know prop masters that work primarily in like crime dramas be it grantchester Edmonton murders chelsea detectives stuff like that that when you learn to like those kind of jobs, you go, actually, no, I'll, st I'll stick around for a few more jobs. And then, like you said, you, you've got the risk of, well, you've been doing this for now two or three years. Like, no one else knows who you are. So you have to, I think, build up a comfort blanket and then you need to s 
take a step away and go, listen, this is no, there's no professional disagreement. I'd just like to pursue another project. And you think when you first do that, especially for the first time, you think that that's going to be let, met with a lot of animosity. But then people that you've worked for that have worked in the industry for so long, they know the nature of the beast. Like you're not going to want to work with the same person all the time. And it's good to pursue your dreams and your plan A, B, C, and D. So you can go, listen, I want to work on this production, so I'm going to take some time away. I'm going to build up my CV. I'm going to build up my skill base, build up my kit, and then I'm going to apply to work on a different job of a different caliber and and hope you get it. And that's how you sort of make the step up into the next echelon of, of propping. And you mentioned uh, upgrade your kit. Could you go into some more detail about what that kit would be? Oh, wow. Well, um, a kit can range from anywhere between having a Leatherman on your hip to having an 18 ton truck full of everything you could ever think of and anything in between. It's one of the most fascinating things I like about my industry is looking at how other people have their kits. So on something like Midsummer Murders, uh, you'd have like a three and a half ton Luton um, that would be full of all your your kit. But you, I always say that the prop team is there to cater for chaos. So we're there, we've got an entire truck full of what ifs. Like they might say, oh, we're doing a normal scene here, but suddenly we want it to be look like it's been raining. So you grab a hose pipe that you have on on board on your truck. You wet down the entire street because they've suddenly decided on a whim, we want to soak this down and we haven't got a, a visual effects or SFX team in to, to do this. So it's now down to you. Everything sort of boils down to whatever any other department can't do. The last people they go to is props and they'll go, can you facilitate this? And a lot of times we'll go, We'll try and we'll make it work. And and so, yeah, we'll have anything on board from uh, weapons to uh, like fake bodies to uh, dog leads to food consumables, um, fake wine, fake beer, like anything in between. And, and we're, we always have a little bit of everything because then if the director really wants a certain thing, it's great for us to be able to go, actually, we can make that work for you. It's not scripted. We've not planned for it. But as a standby, you always have extra stuff on. You're not just given the props for the day. You are you bring in your own equipment, your own supplies, and you go, we can make that work for you. And it really helps you achieve really great things. And I, I have had so many moments where I've been quite proud of, like, oh, we need, we need this to work. Like, I've had to... Um, I made a dead body once on on Grantchester because they wanted someone pulling uh, a body on a gurney out of a, out of a house. And I created an entire... Because we didn't have a, a mannequin or anything like that. So I used random bits I could find on my truck, like rolled up tarps, a pair of wellies, and I fashioned this. I modelled it on the actor as well. I had him lie down and I built it around him and created this fake body. And then I saw it on the show when it aired last year and I was like, that's a really good body. I did that and I was really proud of that. And the director came up to me and was like, you really got us out of the lurch there. Like, it was really good that we got to have that shot. And so, yeah, we, we're expected to create the impossible if we're not talking all grandiose but yeah it's there's always something on your truck and i've i've been on larger scale productions like uh, i worked very briefly on the marvel film morbius um which was an interesting film <laughs> <laughs> and i got to go on the prop uh, the standby props that a guy called gary dawson who is the greatest standby prop in the industry i've only i've only had the privilege of working with him a couple of times but his truck is a gorgeous machine of precision and everything is labeled everything's in boxes he's got everything from fake fruit to scuba gear because you never know what it's going to come with and that's why he has the reputation he has because he has everything available oh. he can give the director anything they request like i wonder if you could talk about how do you prepare that van so presumably you start a job mm -hmm. and then you have to do they buy all that and put it on the van yeah i mean it's a mixture of you have your own kit so i have my own kit um that i have in a storage locker so it's about a three and a half ton trucks worth of stuff and then once you get on board with the production and you have you read through the script and you look you learn like what kind of things happen in the everyday scenes that you go oh i've got like a a wireless computer system that i can use to uh so a lot of times in like police dramas they'll have like their tv their computer screens and they're working on it but they're not actually doing it the standby prop is at a distance doing all the motions and stuff so it's done with precision and they can repeat actions perfectly and the direct the actor can focus on their lines and their dialogue um so you'll read through a script and you'll work out what's expected of you like oh, okay this is a a tv show or a film that there's a lot of fight scenes so we're going to need um like crash mats and stuff like that to assist the stunts team with stuff like that um but then also if you're doing a lot of um 
Grizzly murders, like you get with Midsummer murders, you have s- stuff like silicon blood pools. That means you can lay them down on a on a listed building, and it's just a silicon pool. It looks like a wet pool of blood, but it is completely dry and completely safe, and doesn't mark the fifteenth century wooden floors. Um, and so, yeah, you just think about what kind of stuff you might need, but then you just go, and I'm just going to chuck a load of extra stuff on of, of what ifs. So. You'd have everything from like camo netting for to cover lights and stuff that's in the back of shot. Like there's been numerous times where they've got a beautiful shot of someone walking along a driveway, but there's an 18 ton MBS lighting truck in the background that they can't move because it's all wired in for the lights and the facility power. And so you have to climb up on a ladder and cover the whole thing with a camo net because otherwise the shot can't be used. So you have camo nets, you have all sorts of any anything you can think of. And a lot of times there'll be stuff that you go, I haven't got that. Um but it'll be really good. So you talk to the art department and they have buyers that will buy props for the show, but there's also buyers that will buy consumables and stuff that is towards your kit. So you are given, the art department is given a consumables budget um, on each production. So that goes to, from anything from tapes to um, fake blood to any sorts of things and in between. And as long as it's within reason and you're not truly taking the mickey with it, you can get a lot of extra stuff um, in that re- can really get you out of the out of the lurch when you're in a high tense situation. And so, if you're a new prop, uh, standby prop, mm-hmm. and you want to build up your kit, yeah. how did you start doing that? Was this you already had a long standing interest, and you were just acquiring stuff over time, yeah. or you grab it off of other jobs that you know yeah. they've been used and they're not needed anymore? Like, how do you, how does um, one build up that kit? Yeah, it's it's a lot of it is um, you get a lot of secondhand stuff from people like. People will buy stuff um, that you like that you're working with. So you're working with like a really high ranking uh, standby prop. Um, they'll have a load of kit, and they'll buy a new version of something, and they'll go, "Oh, do you want do you want this?" And you go, "Yeah, all right. It might be a bit broken, but as long as you can work with it and it works and it can get you out of the out of the lurch every now and again, it's it's worth its weight in gold." Um, but yeah, you you do just sort of work out what kind of stuff you use. A lot of the time, I, I spent working with people when I first started out. That they would have a really cool bit of kit, like um, a cool like a uh, toolbox system, and because everyone's got different toolbox setups, because the the Dewalt Tough System stack thing, um, they will have different drawers, and everyone always has different stuff. And I'll, I'll talk to people, and go, do you mind if I snap a couple of pictures of your of your kit? Because I want to replicate that, because that's a really clever system that you've come up with. And most of the time, people are just like, oh, I didn't think anyone would think that was interesting. I'm like, well, I do, because I I find that kind of stuff. Anything that can streamline my process and can make me a better standby. I will, I will utilize that. And so I've, you know, people have come up with weird systems that I'm like, oh, that's quite cool. I'll do that. Um, and then, yeah, you slowly buy little things and it's for someone that's like a little bit obsessive and, and wants to like have all the new shiny things. It's the worst job because you just like, my missus constantly sees Amazon parcels coming in every other day of like, what's this? And it's like, oh, it's chalk, but it comes in like a little holder. So it like spring loads. So you can do chalk marks on, on the floor for, if you move furniture, you've got to make sure it goes back to the same spot. So you have a spring-loaded chalk release to do that. Like a prop guy that I worked with had one of those, and I thought it was amazing. So I just bought one, and it became part of my everyday carry kit. Yeah. Do you, do you get to charge that to production, or do you just um, do you get a consumables? You get a consumables budget, but a lot of the time, like I'm, I'm quite modest with it. Still, I'm still very much like, oh no, don't worry, I'll get it myself. Like because. I don't want it to. I don't want to have that moment where they're like, "Okay, you're, you're buying too much stuff now," and I'm like, "But it's also shiny and interesting." Um, so a lot of the stuff, like everyday use stuff, you can just absolutely it would go to production, and as long as it's approved um, and you're not doing anything sneaky, like absolutely you'll be you'll be fine with that. But then sometimes if it's something a bit more substantial, like that's coming into a couple of hundred pounds worth of stuff, you might maybe do that yourself, and then that becomes part of your staple kit. But you also are given an allowance uh, for your own kit that you use. So they will pay you a set fee. Um, sometimes it's a mandatory fee of like £10 a day, which is nothing in the grand scheme of things, but it's a nice sentiment. But then on larger productions, you'd have a percentage of your kit's value. So you'd have your kit assessed and they'll say, okay, your kit's worth £20,000. We'll pay you X amount per week. And that's in your contract as you as you do it. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're buying bigger things, a lot of times people will just go, I, I will buy this just for me because I'm going to use this for the next 10 years on the next five jobs. It's so an investment. It's an investment, absolutely. Um, so yeah, smaller scale stuff, absolutely through art department. Larger scale stuff is more of an independent personal purchase. So. And can you give us a kind of range of what percentage you'd get? 
Um, again, it depends. That's what it's up for negotiation with contracts and stuff like that. For for me, I've not done something of of that scale yet within my career. Um, and yeah, it's it's something like I believe it's like ten percent of your kit's value sometimes. But it also depends on what you're actually bringing to it because if you start to ask for too much, that's when line producers and stuff start going through lists and going, well, actually, you don't need a microwave on a medieval drama. Like, why would you invoice for that? And it gets a bit. As long as as long as you're being honest with it and you're truly saying I can't this job cannot be done without me having th- this they would understand that and they'd say okay we'll pay you a set fee for that um but it's again it's a negotiable fee it's not something that's set by any independent body it's usually done by production to production yeah and mm. I, I think a point that you're emphasizing there that I think is really worth highlighting is we own good money mm-hmm. don't let the kit rental damage your reputation absolutely and affect your ability to get future work because it's the this is a nice extra way to earn a bit more mm-hmm. treat it that way oh yeah absolutely and it's it's key is to being is being both fi- uh, personally and financially humble a lot of the time with the industry is going below your means when you can um but then eventually almost karmically it cut, does come back round again because if you're someone that constantly bills production for loads of stuff all the time that they don't really see, you're less likely they're going to go, well, he, you know, when we did that series with him, he used a lot more money. And so we want to use someone that maybe uses a lot less. And, and that's when it gets into the negotiations of whether or not it actually affects your job prospects or stuff like that. I haven't encountered many people in my time that have been like that. Um, but they, you, you do tend to just work out what you need and, and what's the right thing for you. Yeah. You talked a bit about, being humble, mm-hmm. and also about how uh, junior props people need to be practical and know how to use power tools. Sure, you know that sort of thing. Could you sort of talk about what sort of character traits? Not character traits isn't the right word. What sort Person- of personality character trait? Traits? Yeah, a good props person would. Oh, have. absolutely. Um, the the main thing is being keen as mustard. Like you just you come in and you give it your absolute all, but it's also honesty. That's something that is. It took me a while to realize in my early days is that you if you don't know how to do something tell them like you i remember the first time i ever came onto a set as a dressing prop um i worked for a um a wonderful dressing prop called bobby thorne um who i think is retired now he's a wonderful man and we turned up at heads of house um and we were going to be hanging curtains for like 10 hours these wonderful because they have these huge double height ceilings i'm sure you're familiar with it in the locations world um and i said to him he's like have you ever hung curtains before And I was like, no. And he went, right, I'll tell you what, my name's Bob, you're George. There is no such thing as a bad question. Like, if you don't know, just tell me. And instantly, all anxiety and stress of like, you know, the first day at school nerves went away because he's like, there's no such thing as like a stupid question. If you don't know how to do something, tell them because A, you'll learn how to do it the right way. And B, if you don't know what you're doing, especially in props and dressing props, you can seriously injure yourself or create damage on something and you might feel awkward having to ask for something to be repeated and Mm -hmm. feel like i should get straight away yeah people would much rather you annoy them by asking a question several times oh yeah than doing it saying you understand when you don't Mm -hmm. and then injuring yourself injuring someone else damaging property oh yeah i've seen i've seen trainees put like four inch nails into a listed building's wall oh yeah that made you twitch didn't it oh yeah um yeah because they go oh hang up these curtains and i and so they were sat there knocking one knocking it in um and i said oh have you found out if we can do that yet if we drill into the wall and they go oh who are we meant to ask and i went okay you're you're going to learn something today so i came down and took him by the hand physically by the hand he's a young lad i brought into location i was like tell him what you did he said i'll put a nail in the curtain thing and they went right and instantly it was all battle stations, like production on the phone, like we've done this, we've done that. And luckily enough, the homeowner was in a good mood that day. And they said, listen, accidents happen. Just I'm glad it's only the one that he's done rather than the 20 curtains we had to hang up that you would have made look like Swiss cheese. So how would you go about, I presumably like when a new starter starts, how would you mm-hmm. go about making sure they don't do silly things like that? Presumably you brief them, this yeah. is a listed house and oh, yeah. don't damage it. Yeah. Ask us if you're unsure. Yeah, you sort of... Um, Teach them the art of setiquette is what I call it. Is Ooh, the, great term. Thank you. I'm adamant I came up with that term and I've heard it <laughs> around and I'm like, that's me. Um, but it's basically you teach them how to 
how to ask the right questions. So it's like they're, they're in like a big posh house and they go, right, we want to hang curtains. You teach them how to do it practically. And then afterwards you teach them the extra stuff that happens. So it's like, okay, right now we've hung these curtains up in here and it looks great, but you can't do this in every location. Cause some like you will have locations where the homeowner will absolutely go batshit at you if you've done something remotely damaging. And I'm sure in your locations career, you've met with a lot of people that own these listed buildings that are very difficult to work with, but quite rightly because they have a 500 year old house with priceless wood and everything in place. So you teach them the process of not just the practical skills they're doing, but the actual professional skills that are required before that. So everything you do before you even do the job, you you go into a location, you go, right, where's safe to put stuff? Like you liaise with the locations department because a lot of time when you're dressing a location, even though the actual film crew isn't there, you will have a representative from the locations department or something like that You can who is your point of contact. And so you go, right, we've been told they want curtains up in this window. They said it's fine, but do you think it's fine? Is there any other steps or anything like, because we want to cover ourselves and make sure that we don't do anything that can cause, because that kind of stuff can cause massive financial implications to a film production, like big time. And so you teach them like basically the steps you have to take before you even take the first steps kind of thing. And locations are the ones who know because they've they've organized that whole Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Do you find that when you're dressing as opposed to when you're on set, is it is there more time to work these things out or is oh, it as, as a fast pace? Absolutely. Like in, in standby props, a lot of the time, if you're working on a big scale production, you have about 30 seconds to do everything you need to do. Like if there's a problem or something needs to change, you've got, it's not just like, oh, we're filming. It's like, oh, the lights are set this certain way. The camera is in this position. The actor is on their first position. Like you need to move in like a shark, just go straight in, move this around. This needs to change. This needs to change because you're making a small change, but because you've done that, it means that take is usable. If it's, if it's like a five minute scene of people talking, but like something's in the wrong position, that takes not usable because the continuity is off. Like they'll like, it's the thing that, it's the biggest curse of working in the film industry because it's when you watch film and TV shows now, you watch it through the eyes of someone that works in that industry. So I'm constantly looking out for continuity errors in TV shows, especially with like levels of drinks in a glass and stuff like that. What are you going to say? Sorry. And then you are constantly boring people who don't work in the oh, industry. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think I think my, uh, my fiance is very much like, uh, she just tunes it out now, like background static. Um, who's, but yeah, who's monitoring continuity? Who are you uh, working with on that? Uh, so the continuity is monitored by uh, standby art director and script supervisor. So the standby art director's role, who is sort of the supervisor to the standby props on set. So we would answer to them a lot of the time because they are the on-set representation for the art director who isn't with the direct film crew. He's the one that helps create the sets. Um, so uh, so the standby art director and the script supervisor will maintain continuity because a lot of the times in shows, um, it looks like it's all happening in the same time, but they'll have one shot of someone opening a door with a file under their arm. And then six weeks later, we're in a studio shooting the inside of them coming in. So that folder needs to be in the same arm. They're not going to know that. They've been remembering their lines. They've had numerous meetings and directorial notes and stuff like that. So it's down to us to remember, oh, when he walked in through that door, he had it in his left hand. So six weeks later, we're 500 miles away or maybe even a different country. We go, right, this was in your left hand. The label was facing this way and that's that. Because when you're watching TV shows, subconsciously you pick up on a lot more than you realise. So you'll see it change and you'll go... That's weird. Why does that look weird? And you don't know why, but it's because your brain is is constantly checking for patterns. What's so, the, what's the conversation look like for that continuity? So, do you get a briefing at the beginning of the day where they've gone through the notes and they've said, "Okay, this was like you say the file in the left hand." Yeah. Uh, so throughout the filming process, the a standby art director would have a direct feed monitor of what the camera sees, and so through each take and each setup, they would take screen grabs from that. So anytime there is a prop on screen and it moves significantly. It's like doing a, um, a driver's hazard perception test. So you're watching something and every time something changes, you're clicking and everything like that. It's the same when you're taking continuity stills. So you see like someone walks in and they've got a mug of coffee in their hand. You take a photo as they come in so you can see how they're holding it, like at what position the the low, like if there's any logos or anything like that. If it's facing the camera, if it's away from camera, they can then put it down on a table and they sit and have a conversation with someone. They pick it up then with their left hand. You take another still. 
And so throughout you build up this sort of archive of that and then you of of the scene. And obviously the scene could be split up across multiple days, schedule wise. And then later on down the line, they go, right, we're doing scene uh, episode three, scene 18. We did 17 six weeks ago. Um, where was his cup in his hand? And obviously we'd have all of the props again. They would be arranged with the art department and the props team. They would bring all those relevant props back because sometimes we'll carry them for the extent of a job if it's a, a key action prop or a hero prop, as we refer to them. Um, but sometimes they are taken away and they come back and then they go, right, this is the mug that he had eight weeks ago. So you go, right, that was in the, your hand. So you go up to actor John Smith and you go, right, this is the cup you were holding in that scene. You're now coming out of that thing. So when you stood up, you had it in your right hand. So when you exit And the you room, as the prop department say that to the actor. Yes, 100%. We will liaise with them. And the actors, they fully understand the process. Um, a lot of times you'll, well, I haven't, I haven't had it too many times in, in my career, but a lot of times the actor's like, oh, no, no, it's in my, it's in my left hand. I remember I was there. And I go, yeah, okay. Right, so. And then I get an iPad <laughs> out and go, no, you you don't like it's this hand because then otherwise you'd get a massive. And is it, is it the standby art director who does the prep for that shoot day? Are they uh, the ones going? Oh, we're going from seventeen to eighteen after the last after yes, six weeks. Yeah, they would they would liaise, and then they brief the rest of the prop team, the standby yeah, prop team. Yeah, a lot of the time they will um, they will liaise with the prop team. Like we as standby props, we will do a similar thing as contingency. So, like at the start of every production, you would do a breakdown of the script. So you'd read through the script, you'd write every single prop you can see and when it turns up, and then you would write a on an Excel spreadsheet of like scene one, page one, he has a cup in his left hand. Like, And then you keep doing it and you build up this sort of Bible of everything and you work alongside the standby art director with their version of it. So then it's two sets of eyes on the same problem. Um, yeah, the standby art director, if there's any changes or anything like that, it's liaised to them. Um, and then they will liaise it to the standby props team and saying, oh, actually, they've cut that scene, so we can now change the continuity later on. Um, so it's sort of down to, it's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different people and a lot of stuff to manage, but after a couple of jobs, it becomes muscle memory. Um, I mean, not saying any of us don't make mistakes, like I've been guilty of a couple of continuity issues along my my career, if I try and remember one. Um, but yeah, drinks levels, that's a big one that I constantly pick up on is someone's having a cup of tea or like a glass of wine and you'll watch it and all throughout the scene the, the wine glass the levels up and down up and down up and down and you won't really see it properly if they move quick enough but sometimes for people like me that work in it you go wine glasses all over the place because sometimes I've heard this that editors will edit to tell the best emotional story beat and they might yeah. ignore the wine glasses because yeah. they'll both actually in the grand scheme of things it's not yeah. as big a deal yeah and a lot of times they'll punch in uh, because obviously they they film on 4K and then condense it down, so they have more shot options that they don't need to shoot twice. So sometimes you'll be really worried because you'll go up to because if you make a problem like that, again it's about honesty. So if you go up to the script supervisor and you'll go because um, obviously they're, they're making all the notes for the scene that then go on to the editors. Um, if you go up to them and go, I'm really sorry, his briefcase was in his left hand on that one, not his right. And they go, it's fine because we're going to use that as a punch in. So, or we'll we'll we've shot three or four versions of that. So it just means we can't use that version. It's not the end. And the script one. supervisor knows that. Yes. And they're having conversations with the director. Yeah, because they're usually sat right next to the. So the director is there with his monitor with his cans, and the script supervisor is usually very close to them, and they liaise throughout the entire shoot day of like, oh, that needs to be there, or that needs to be there. So the script supervisor is also constant is looking at their own monitor, and they're they're wired for continuity. So they they go like. You'd shoot one side of a room and you've moved all the furniture out and then you flip the camera the other way and like a chair is missing or a stack of books or something like the average person wouldn't notice something like that. But the script supervisor goes, there's meant to be something over there, isn't there? And they'll watch back their previous takes or their continuity photos that they take and they then liaise with us. And then we go, oh, no, we've we've missed that stack of books. And sure enough, it's underneath a grips chair somewhere and you just go and pop it back in place and then you go, ah, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, continuity is king wonder if they walk into a room of their house and go, oh, someone was looking at the photo of my mother-in-law today. Absolutely. It's turned Absolutely. Like three degrees. You notice the <laughs> weirdest things. Like, it's it's it changes how you view a lot of things in life. It, like, it makes you, it sort of gives you OCD. Like, I was, my partner would describe me as someone that's quite messy, but then when I tidy, it's like I'm cleaning a crime scene. Like, it's just <laughs> everything is in its perfect place. Um, if I get the motivation to properly do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The other bizarre skill that continuity needs to have is, it's going to sound slightly obscene, but the ability to resist going to the toilet. Oh, God. Because yeah. they're, they, <laughs> they, 
and mm. I never see them leave because they're chained to the monitor yeah. and chained to checking that no one is moving in, you know. Yeah. Because if they disappear for... There's only one oh, of them normally, right? There is only one of them. They, they, so they don't have someone to cover them. Yeah. I so mean, that's... God knows how they do it. Yeah, it, hap- <laughs> it happens in standby as well. Like, you you just... If you're doing a particularly difficult scene where there's a lot of complicated resets, like someone throwing a glass and it breaks, you've got to clean everything up, replace it with a new breakaway glass... Um, you then have to wait and they go, right, we're turning the cameras around or we're changing the lighting setup. That is your opportunity. Like you you don't get to work on your own bladder schedule. Like you just have to do it when you get the opportunity. They go, so you can go up to the first AD and go, what? how long was the turnaround on this? And they go, oh, you got about 10, 15 minutes. You're like, okay, you can go outside. You can go for a wee, go get a sandwich, like have a cigarette, whatever you need to do. Um, but you don't get to do it on a regular schedule that would be in your own mind. You don't have that kind of freedom because... If you leave, that's where continuity problems happen. And the worst thing that can happen is when you've gone away and they've gone, they've done a whole take and it's like a big scene and something's wrong and they're only doing it from one angle and there's something wrong. And then you have to go up and tell the entire film crew that you've got to do the whole thing again because you wanted to go have like yeah. a muffin. Like, <laughs> it's it's the worst. You go, I'm really sorry. And yeah, we've got to move that because that's not there. So- and then you have to argue about the continuity a lot of time because sometimes even the director will go oh no no it's fine like they won't notice that and you go but we did and that's our job so we want it noted that this is wrong and you flagged it that the, but we flagged it as long as we flagged it and the director is happy with it the power then they obviously a king of the crew so they have what they say goes and that's the big thing cross departments with that is you go this is the issue mm-hmm. we've noted it and then sure. first AD, director, producer, exec, someone can say, nope, that's fine, we're moving on. Yeah. And you accept it. So it's you're there to raise that concern yeah, and then respond however the powers that be want you to respond. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's all about communication. Um, it's all about communication and honesty because at the end of the day, we're all, work, we're, all walk, yeah, we're all working towards the same goal. Like we all want to make good telly and good films. And if something is wrong, like... It's it's wrong and it's not what we want. Yeah, in six years I've never come some across someone who goes, you know what? I really hope this take is terrible. Yeah, you know, I just, uh... I've had I've had directors that have done that. <laughs> that they've just said like, I really hope this one's rubbish because I'm sick and tired of doing this and I want to move on. <laughs> like, there's the amount of times you do 15 takes of someone drinking a glass of whiskey or something, ha- and you go. Have you worked with any actors that are sufficiently high profile? They tell the director the day is over. Stephen Graham. Every single time. Stephen Graham, and I, I will say this for the rest of my career, Stephen Graham is the greatest actor I've ever worked with. His level of professionalism and stuff is is unmatched. I worked on a series of called Code 404, um, where he plays a police detective in slightly into the future, and his colleague, played by Danny Mays, is a cyborgly enhanced policeman. But it's it's a comedy, but it's also serious a lot of times. And I was quite intimidated about working with someone like Stephen because he is just, his back catalogue is just greatness after greatness. And he's a fantastically natural performer. Um, and one of the scenes, the first scene I had with him, he was walking into a into the sort of conference room and it's like halfway through the show. So obviously they shoot everything so out of order. So you don't really get what the hell's going on. Even if you've read the script, you're like, oh, they're coming in and they're having an argument, but you don't know what it's about. But here's your stuff. So I went up to him and I was like, oh, you're right, Mr. Graham. My name's George. I'll be your standby prop. And he's like, oh, nice to meet you. And he's really nice, very approachable. Um, and I said, oh, uh, your mug's going to be in your left hand and you've got this police file, which was a key prop with the scene, is going to be in your right hand. And he was like, I'm, I'm going to do it the other way. And I go, okay. And obviously still first day of school nerves. I went, the director and the standby art director have said it's got to be this way around. So I've just got to enforce that. And he's like, I'll do it the other way. And I go, Okay. Like I've given two opportunities to correct it. Like everything after that is out of my hands. And sure enough, he goes into the scene and his body language of what he intended would never have worked if they were the other way around. It sounds daft, but the way that he expresses, because he was, I think he's left-handed, um, he's more dominant the other way. And the director didn't know that. So the whole scene would have been different if he just had done it in the way that I was told to tell him. Like, And so I literally, he came back out of the scene and he, he gave me this stuff back and I was like, I'll never question how you hold props again. Like what you say goes. And I did that throughout the entire production and I had an absolute blast working with him. He, well, signed, he signed my birthday card. I was uh, so happy. <laughs> well, was that a continuity problem then? That well, it? it's, it's, it's like the, you're trying to enforce continuity from the get-go. So what I was trying to do w- within my professional capacity, as much as he is this amazing A-list actor, like I wanted to be like, 
this is how you're doing things. So then going forward, he then trusts in me that every time I hand him stuff and go, this goes in this hand or this goes under your arm like this, or you need this on your shoulder or whatever. He believes me because he knows it's not just my opinion. It's based on the continuity and the notes and the amount of screenshots and, and work from multiple different people that I work alongside. Um, but it was just in that instance where it was like the first scene and I was like, right, I trust in it. Obviously I still gave it a second guess every time. Like if he says, oh, I want to do it like this, I'll go, I'd double down and be like, you literally cannot do it that way because we've like, it's like the example of shooting stuff weeks apart. Like we do a lot of interior studio stuff at the police station, but then exterior stuff would have to match. And he's like, oh, it's going to be in my right hand. And I go, it can't be. It needs to be in your left because your keys are in your right hand and you're opening the car like you did on that previous scene that you shot six weeks ago. But narratively, it was five seconds ago. Mm -hmm. So you have to enforce that level of continuity sometimes. But then a lot of times you can loosen the reins slightly and give them a little bit more um, creative freedom as, as actors. Particularly when it is the take that will establish the continuity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if it's the, you don't know which one they're going to use, but then you can do five or six different setups and the director would talk to the script supervisor and go, that's the one we're going to use for the establisher. And so they liaise that with us. And then we know that we need to match continuity to that particular take. Cause obviously they might do things different ways. Cause they'll go, the director will go, actually, I want him to come in this way. We've not shot anything on it yet, but do it this way. And then a couple of takes later, he'll, you know, in his directorial way go, no, actually it would be better if we did it this way. And so as soon as we know which take they're committing to that we liaise with the script supervisor, we then put that in as concrete. So later on, we will match to that exact take. And we, it's down to us as well. I like to make notes of what takes they've used and what takes they want to be as the base to go on. with. That must make it so hard when the scene has been shot two or more different ways and the director has not yet decided which yep. is the take that will be canon. Yeah. yeah. For lack of a, lo a lot of time, that's when you would have like a little mini meeting on set and you'll you'll get the standby art director, the standby prop, the script supervisor and go, listen, we can't match continuity to four different versions of something if we're only going to shoot another one setup of this. So someone's got to make a decision of what one you want to use. Otherwise, none of this is usable. So it would be wasted time shot. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of difficult conversations a lot of time. But again, because it's a common goal, um, a lot of times people will just go, okay, screw it, we'll do op option C. We like that version of it. So that's the one we're going to use. That's the Bible. Does the director say, like, comment on every prop position? I mean, obviously there's the hero prop, so I presume they, they do on every hero prop. Yeah. But you sort of said about the director said mm. that Stephen Graham should have the mug in that hand, mm. isn't it, man? Is that, for, are they thinking that of every prop? Has the director uh, constantly got that in mind? A lot of times the the director, because they, they have so much on their plate that they've they've got to take into account because they want to know how the shot is going to move, like how the camera's going to move to the scene so they're liaising with the grit department, how it's going to be lit so they're liaising with the Sparks team and stuff like that. A lot of the time props are the least considered in that scene, but to us it's like, we're telling you this now because then when you get into the cutting room, you won't then have to go, why is this cup changing colour? Why is he holding that book that way? Why, why is that chair there? Like, Because then he suddenly realises, actually, I, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't tell the story I want it to tell. So a lot of the times we will come up to the director and we will do it in advance a lot of the time. So if we've got, um, like, a, like a, say, like a diary or something of, uh, of a character that changes uh, throughout the show, there, there's more stuff added to it. It's referenced as a hero prop. Like we will bring it to the director as early in advance as we can. I try and work in like a 72 hours to a week beforehand that we'll go up and go, right, we're shooting this next Tuesday. This is how it looks. Um, are you happy with this? And they'll go, yes. And then that's it locked in. But then they can give feedback, to which we can then send to the graphics department or the art department. And they can make the amendments they want. We then bring the amendments back even before we shoot and we go, right, these are the amendments you've said. Is this right? And they go, yes, that's perfect. Or no, one more time. Can you rip that page in a certain way? Can you redraw this design? Because it needs to look like this because I've had a discussion with the actor and he can't do that sort of drawing. So can you change the style of the drawing? And it's all these different moving parts that come in to create this one prop that you will see for half a nanosecond. Um, but it's crucial that it's right and it's down to us that it needs to be right because if they shoot it and it's wrong it's our heads on the chopping block so again preparation is key so a lot of the time we're watching takes happen but we're also that's why there's more than one of us so one of us will be directly on the floor no usually the first 
and the second is liaising everything and is anticipating the chaos to come. So they're looking at the schedule, they're looking at the script, and they're going, right, this scene needs this prop. We haven't got it. Where is it? Is it being hired? Is it being made? Is it being purchased? And then you work out the timeline of the object. So you know when it's coming to you, you know when you're having it for, you know whether or not you're allowed to hold on to it for a period of time because you've got a scene in two weeks' time. Like you'll have something... Uh, Okay, I worked with uh, on a job where we had like a, a vintage Cartier lighter that was worth like a thousand pounds. And they said, right, you've got it on this day. And I said, okay, can we hold on to it for a week? And they go, no, we can't because it's an insurance issue. So once we've shot the scene, we then pack it, packaging everything up in its safety box. Like we're locking it away. We then hand it to back to the art department. They then hold on to it securely in their building. And then it's brought back out to us when it wants to come and play. And there must be a really impressive system for tracking these, where these props are at any given point it's that it's just there the it's, amazing mind it's just the mind like it's <laughs> well it's the mind and it's schedules and it's lots of emails and phone calls and texts and but and you WhatsApp hold groups. props in in containers or warehouses yeah. and stuff and you must be you, you wouldn't want to go in there and just find oh yeah there's it. yeah there's there are it's almost like a Imagine the most boring Argos warehouse you've ever been into. It's like that. So there's just racks and racks of stuff. There'll be set numbers uh, written along in, in gaff tape. They'd write down like uh, Sarah's house evening. And then it's that's all the stuff that goes into that scene. Um, you'd like your agent to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, George is being too modest here. It's less Argos kind of back catalogue and more, you know, John Lewis. <laughs> More, more the museum where you've got the Ark of the Covenant at the end of yeah, the, no, it is. You're just like, that yeah, is some cool yeah. random stuff that they've I got. I downplay it so then people don't think it's boring. Um, but then it's like when they go in and it's just mad stuff. Like It's it's like when you go into prop houses. So we hire props from uh, what they call prop houses and there's numerous ones all around London. There's several up in the Midlands and up north and all over the world really actually. But each place sort of specialises in certain things. So you've got companies like Super Hire which is like the world's biggest car boot sale. It's like, you want an umbrella? They've got 40,000 of them. And set decks and designers will go down there and go, right, in Gerald's apartment, we need it to look like a bloke in his 60s lives there. So they go to every department, like chairs, tables and stuff like that, and they search that kind of stuff. You go to something like that, and it is, like you said, it's this beautiful, amazing warehouse that's so... It, most of the time it's organised, um, but you go in there and it's just like, there's always something to look at. It is like a, a knick-knack mecca of amazing things like it's so good um and yeah there's so we then get these hired from all these different companies they come to a central place and the uh storeman which is the other prop title which is another one of the slight branches slightly up um they will get we'll get massive an 18 ton truck with loads of cardboard boxes that have all got these all all these individual things bubble wrapped in they unwrap absolutely everything they lay it out all on tables they photograph every single thing they write down numbers for each every every single individual item from someone's car to a toothbrush and everything in between and they work out that everything's there they check that everything has been delivered on time and then they package all of that back up it's then put in a truck sent down to the set which is met by the dressing team and then they will put everything into place like from there and they will do the same thing. The storeman will meet them there and the storeman will have all the paperwork with has all the different props listed and they will go through everything. There are so many different stages of security and logging that a lot of the time you, you can't miss stuff, but sometimes you do. Like sometimes you'll leave a set and they go, oh, where's that Ming vase that we hired? And you go, oh, I left it in that bloke's toilet. Like it's <laughs> like, it's, Yeah. And then you get a text or a call from props asking when they can go back to the location. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you go. Um, hi, it's the location department. You know, we signed off on that location, and we said absolutely, we never need to go back there. Um, yeah, we we left that bathtub on the roof, <laughs> and you just go right. Okay, <laughs> have you got the keys? <laughs> I was wondering if we could perhaps go into your first job in props. Oh yeah, absolutely. So. Maybe talk us through what that job was, how you got that job. Okay, yeah. Um, so I got into props in in a quite a bizarre way uh, and not the traditional path. So I used to work in locations, facilities and security. It's where I met Daniel and I worked with him a couple of times. And I was working on a job called The Nest, which was a um, psychological drama with Jude Law. Um, and it did the festival circuit. It was an okay film. Um, and we were filming at Nether Winchington House uh, near Aylesbury for like eight weeks. And so as locations, your main duty is like 
you go in, set up, set, make, make sure everyone is set up, make sure everyone's pa- like got power, make sure everyone's wearing blue shoes, even though they don't. Um, easy ups are covering stuff if it's weather. Blue They're shoes not, for, sorry, for people listening, oh, yes, is the course, yeah. plastic that you put over your shoes. Protective so you, covering. Yeah. yeah, so if you're working in a very um, expensive house with really expensive carpets, um, the film crew comes in, they're like unattended toddlers and they will just run around outside in the mud playing tag and then run in the house and track mud everywhere. And it's down to the wonderful locations department to make sure that they don't ruin this priceless rug. Um, so I had a lot of downtime when I was on this job um, because it was quite self-sufficient. The crew was very courteous. I didn't have to check on them or clip anyone around the ear for for breaking stuff. And I started talking to the props team and just sort of helping them when I could. So they were unpacking props or packing stuff up or moving furniture. And I met this guy, Joe Locke, um, who was the standby props trainee on the job. And we got to talking and we became fast friends. And um, he, a couple of weeks later, we were talking and I'd finished this job and I was working on Hobbs and Shaw, I think, over at Leaveston Studios. And I remember vividly where I was. I was outside the studio as a studio assistant and I was putting a bin bag in a bin outside the Rocks Stuntman's trailer. And I got a phone call and it was this guy, Joe, and he said, do you want to work in locations? And I went, hmm. And it had started to wear on me that I was like, maybe this isn't the exact department I wanted to work in. Not that there was anything wrong with it, but I was like, I feel like there's, after working with these props guys and hearing their stories and hearing what they what they would have to do in their in their day to day job, it sounded a bit more like me. And I said this to Joe, like, if you ever get a chance, I'd love to be able to work with you, even if it's for free, just to get a bit of experience. Um, and he said, uh, "You're you're a, a props trainee tomorrow." And I went, "Sorry." And he went, "Yeah, you're you're on a job tomorrow." And I went, "I'm I'm on this job now. I've, I'm working for the rest of the week." And he's like, "I, I don't care. Go talk to your." Um, whoever your boss is and tell them this is what you're doing. And luckily I was, I had a really good relationship with the, um, with the location manager I was working for at the time. And I said, listen, I've opportunities come knocking and I really think I should take it. And he went, absolutely. We'll find someone to cover you. It's fine. And, uh, I then phoned it back and I said, what do I do? Sorry, what you can say. I was going to say, I I think that's really worth highlighting. If you do good work, you're friendly, you turn up in time, you get an opportunity in another department. Mm. 95 times out of 100, Absolutely, yeah. your person above you will go, not just do it, they'll be thrilled for you. Yeah, now, it's good if exactly. you can say, and I've got this person and they're really good and they could cover my oh, shit. Yeah, that's week. also key, yeah, yeah. is going, but, I've got someone that can cover me, so it's never no stress to you. But you get people who are given those opportunities to change departments or step up or whatever, and they don't take them because they're worried that it will be judged. And it's people get, this is a freelance, you're building, you're trying Absolutely, different things yeah. out. So I just wanted to highlight... Mm particularly if you're doing all the right stuff in that role, expect people to be enthusiastic, not pissed off. Oh, absolutely. No, 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 don't worry about it at all. Um, It's, yeah, I completely agree. As long as you are, if you're good at your job and you're, like you said, respectful, you've got good time management, that is key in this industry. Um, And as long as you're talking to them and you're communicating with them about stuff, as long as it doesn't come out of the blue at the worst time ever, like you, I remember I'd spoken to him. His, his name was Mitch Green, um, and uh, I said, "Oh yeah, I've been thinking about moving on to props." And it had been a conversation, and I said, "There might be a chance that something could come off it," but my modesty got in the way of me, and I thought, "Oh, well, it's never going to be me. I'm never going to get that call." And then suddenly I did, and I was like, "Right, battle stations." And I phoned him back and I phoned Joe back and I said, like, well, what do I what do I need? And he's like, have you got any tools? And I went, mm, no. And he was like, right, give me five seconds. And he sent me a WhatsApp message with a list of like, right, you need a drill, you need drill bits, you need a screwdriver, you need... Luckily enough, I had a Leatherman, um, like a little multi-tool. Go on. Would you be able to send us that and we can put it in the show notes? Oh God, I could I could try if I can find it. I mean, this message, he sent me this about... I can, I can yeah. You can yeah. recreate? I can recreate it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um... And I went round to my local B and Q. I spent my entire week's wages of that week um, buying a bunch of tools, and I turned up at the Columbia Hotel in London. Um, and it was the uh, what film was it? Called? It was called Misbehaviour. It was um, a Kira Knightley film about the uh, 1975 Miss World contest in London, and there was a big controversy there involving uh, Bob Hope and stuff like that. And it was Joe said to me on the phone like listen, I haven't told the prop master of your experience levels, but I know you're good enough, but just go in, be confident, be honest, and you'll be fine. And obviously 
instantly the biggest anxiety ever. I was so nervous. I'd never been more nervous. I'm, I'm usually fine in job interviews, stuff like that. I don't really get those kind of nerves. But this was like a whole new thing. I was entering the big boys club now and I, I didn't know how I was going to feel. And I was welcomed with open arms by everyone there. It was a lovely bunch of people. Aaron Gilbert, Tony Knight, Bobby Thorne, who was the guy I spoke to about the drapes um, earlier at the Heads of House story. And um, yeah, it was it was just a really basic day, just taking the props out that they'd they'd filmed a bunch of scenes in this hotel. They dressed a hotel room to look like the 1970s and it was just packing everything up and they were like, right, can you put all the softs in there? And I'm like, what's, what's a soft? And they go, right, okay, uh, any cushions, blankets, curtains, they refer to as softs. So then you have softs, you've got smalls, um, which is like any small intricate items that you'd have on like uh, a mantelpiece, stuff like that. And I was just so slowly learning all these terms, but then I was asking questions every now and again, but then when it was hectic and everyone was working really quick, you know, ask what needs to be done, do it, keep your head down. Like it's, it's picking your opportunities to learn. So as much as you want to ask them, how do I do this? How do I do that? Sometimes you don't have that opportunity. So just make sure you're safe with it. And if you truly think, oh, I'm, I'm not able to do this, say something. But a lot of the time, just head down, get the graph going and just and get it all out. And then I got to go home at 2.30, which was magical. <laughs> because in locations, you're the first one there, last one gone. You're doing 14 hours a day, no matter what, what it is. And it was this whole new world. And it was amazing. And I carried on doing it. And I worked for a prop master uh, called Ewan Robertson. And he then invited me on to his next film. Uh, as another as a dressing props trainee um, on Ammonite the Kate Winslet film mm. about Mary Anning the 18th, uh, 19th century paleontologist and I got to go down to um, Lyme Regis for like eight weeks staying in a really nice um, centre park style lodge with a bunch of guys that had become really good friends and they knew I was a trainee they were open to teaching me stuff and it was great and then yeah the, the rest they say is history I guess or telly <laughs> How do the rates compare between location marshal or trainee? They're uh, they similar. It's very similar. Very it's similar. very similar because you're, in the nicest way, you're, you're paid your worth mm. at that point. They're they're going to pay you a good. It's like maybe ten, fifteen pounds more a day, if that. It's not like you'll pay more in your ULES charges mm. nowadays. And I'm not going to date this podcast by saying what the rates are because they change all the time. But sure. if you're interested in listening to this, look at the Beck2 website, mm -hmm. which is yeah. the union for, for the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to find a lot of the rates. Yeah, definitely. And it's up, it's it's updated regularly as well. And also, if you're on a job and you believe that you're being underpaid from the Beck2 rate, talk to someone about it and try and get that to be changed. Because as departments, we all need to fight to get competitive rates for what we are are. And um, what we're due, basically. Sorry, I thought that's always something I always get told to say. You got to make sure that people yeah. know about that kind of stuff. And if you're a member of the union, and a production doesn't pay you for whatever reason, what's in your contract, that withholding wages or whatever, they will cover your legal fees. Mm -hmm. so, they will. Join but Betty. Betty's you right. have to be a member before that happens. You can't join in. Yes. Them. So it's like crashing your car and then applying for insurance. Yeah, it, exactly. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I've ever done that. No, not cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. Amazing. What is the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? Oh, my, fir my first one, it's, I thought about this because I've, I've seen on other episodes you've asked other guests this and it's my favorite question. I know. Um, oh, I've, I've been given advice and it sounds like really bad advice, but I was given advice by a dressing prop I work with called Ian Newton. He's a wonderful dressing prop. He's like my work dad. He's been through, he's helped me throughout a lot of aspects of my career. Um, and his thing is take the money and run. That's, that's his advice. And it's basically, sometimes you get really hard days, but you've got to realize that you're getting paid to do something. You're, it is your job a lot of the time. And you've got to remember that a lot of the time because people, people see our industry as very glamorous and we're paid great money to do what we do. But, when you average it out, we're not paid a great wage because we're paid for the gaps that we're not working because we're not working Monday to Friday, 365 days a year. Like there are big gaps and it's like, sometimes you've got to go, it's not the best job, but I'm working and I should be grateful for that because with our industry at the moment, um, there was obviously large strikes that happened last year that affected a lot of us. Um, I finished working in November and I am starting my new project now in April. Like it's been a while. So it's, when the opportunity comes, take it 
and like do your best and really be the best version of yourself and like I said take the money and run can I ask <laughs> what do you do to fill that time do you uh, expand your skill sets or do you take other jobs from different in different industries it's like a lot of video games no um, <laughs> it's yeah it's one of those things of it was difficult this year because I took time off because I worked I had the, the most fortuitous year last year for me I worked flat out from working on the gentleman in January all the way through to finishing in Grantchester in November. And you suddenly realise after you've been running this whole time that you suddenly stop and get a chance to smell the roses. You go, oh, I've not actually seen friends and family that much. I've not been at home all the time and stuff. And it, I realised I needed that time off. So I took a couple of months to just settle and stuff. Like I'd given myself a financial blanket so I knew I'd be safe. I knew my bills would be paid. I knew I could put food on the table and stuff like that. And then when suddenly it gets a bit quieter, you go, oh, I'll get another job. And it's sod's law with this industry. The second you get a job doing something else, the phone doesn't stop ringing. And they go, oh my God, can you come do this 10 month job? Um, so it's just a case of like, take some time for yourself, but don't get too comfortable with it and really just go back double barreled, go full guns blazing and, and go back in for it. Hmm. And what are the job roles that people usually have when they transfer uh, into props, so from outside the industry? So, for example, locations, there's a lot of ex-military personnel mm -hmm. or, truthfully, a lot of ex-farmers. Yeah. Um, what are the equivalents for props? Um, it's a big uh, building of construction. Uh, a lot of people from construction will will transfer across. Uh, my friend Mark, who was a, he's a, he was a contractor, like a building contractor, and he met a prop master I work for in a queue in Screwfix um, a while or a while ago. Um, and Gary, the, the prop master in question, uh, dropped something on the floor. Mark made a joke. They got to talking. And then Gary said, oh, what are you doing next week? And he's like, oh, I'm doing a roofing job. And he went, do you want to come work in the film world? And he was like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, we're building sets and you know, putting stuff in. And, and now Mark has been in the industry for like three years. And his, his first job was um, SAS Rogue Heroes. And he went out to Morocco for 10 weeks. On his first job. Nice. <laughs> I mean, I've not had an international job yet, but <laughs> give it to a guy in Screwfix, Gary, I see. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of construction background. Um, a lot of people change from like graphic design, a lot of stuff and design based stuff. Anything that's sort of art based. I get a lot of painters and stuff that make the transition. So if you work within an art capacity or within the arts itself, you get a lot of people from theatre because they have like set building experience and stuff like that. And they also know about practical effects like blood, smoke, uh, small amount of explosion, special effects stuff. That's very applicable in our industry. If you have stuff that is yeah applicable to on the way across, it, it does work to your favour. Yeah. And then final question in that same vein, what are the temperament of people that, thrive in props how do you mean as in what's there so like for example with dressing props I hadn't realised kind of it's a mark against me but just how much focus it takes oh, to be yeah. paying attention that much on set yeah um, whereas for contrasting locations you're protecting the space but provided everyone's not damaging the location or injuring the public mm -hmm. or injuring each other yeah you're fine it, you know, if the couch goes there as long as you know can restore it Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about what's happening as it is being filmed in, yeah. the, in anywhere near the same degree that you guys are. Mm. Um, so obviously that's one aspect of it. So, you know, if, if you're going to get bored being stuck watching takes over and over yeah. again, yeah, stand by I mean, pops, probably not for you. I mean, don't get me wrong. You, you can be the most attentive person in the world, but if you're watching someone do the same five minute dialogue scene 47 times in a row, anyone will get bored. Like, and no one has that level of attention. Um, but it's, it's good to have a, like a fine eye for detail and, and continuity and, and pattern recognition as well. And it's, and it's just, yeah, it's having the sense of patience, but it's also having confidence. Like that's a big thing that a lot of people I know that I work with, um, that they said, if you could say, where would I improve? And I'd say it's, it's the confidence in being outspoken when you need to, like, if you notice something that's wrong, you make it known. Because it's not your fault that it's necessarily wrong. Because a lot of the time you'll you'll have this amazing set that you've put all together, and then you've gone right. It's all good. I'm, I think everything's fine. And then you go to watch a take, and you go, "Why is that there?" And you look over, and and a grip has moved a table over. And it's it's an instinct for them, and there's nothing wrong with it as much as 
every member of art department is probably screaming at me now, like, don't say that. Um, but people will just instinctively move something out of the way and then they'll put something down and an hour will go by and they, that's not in their head anymore. They're focusing on their own departmental problem. Um, and it's down to us to notice that stuff. So it's having a keen eye for once you see a set, take photos of everything. My phone has got 14,000 photos of sets on it because you have to take photos of absolutely everything because it moves constantly. It's a, it's a living, a set is a living organism. It, it constantly adapts to different things. Stuff has to move to adapt to things around it and lighting changes and all sorts. So it's having a keen eye for detail. It's having, it's just looking at stuff and really taking everything in and really, and taking in what other people have said and anticipating what could possibly go wrong. Cause they go, Oh, we want to put, you hear whispers from other people of like, Oh, the, I think they're putting a camera over there. And then, you know, Oh God, that's going to take us ages to move that. We might need to get more people in to move that. So you find the art department and go, have you got any of the dressing boys around? Because we're about to do, I think there might be a big move on the cards, but no one said anything yet. And it's, it's prevent, it's preempting a lot of the stuff. So a good planning mindset. And I'm going to be really cheeky and ask another final question. Go on. My fiancé can tell you that's a terrible habit with me. If the <laughs> final question goes on for an hour or so. Nothing wrong with that. It's good content. <laughs> um, so the DOP obviously works very closely with the gaffer, so that mm -hmm. that's a departmental relationship that's very close. Sure. What are the kind of equivalent departmental ones where props are kind of almost a step intertwined with another? That's a good question. Um I I would want to say it's it's all departments, but for me personally, I think costume is a big one. Interesting. Go um, so a lot of the time we're doing special effects stuff like blood work or stuff like that that we have to liaise with costume and go. He's going to have this blood on his hand. This will stain. Like how many of these jackets have you got? And they'll go, we've got one. And you go, right. We now need to have a conversation with the director and say this has now got to change because we don't want to limit the actor's ability to do what they want to do by saying you can only move your arm this way because if this drips on this like Burberry jacket we're done for and the whole scene's lost because he'll have a big red blob on him so we liaise with the costume department sometimes with makeup and stuff with practical effects uh, if they've got like um, makeup on of a certain caliber like prosthetics stuff like that and we're applying blood to certain things like we liaise with the makeup department and go, are you managing the blood for this particular scene? Because he's he's holding like a bloody knife. And it's like, we can put blood on the knife, but are we putting it on his hands? Do we know if it's going to be reactive to him? Like, has he got any allergies we're unaware of? So we liaise with the makeup department. But I mean, we also liaise with the lighting department to tell them to get their stands out of the way because they're always in the back of shot. Um, or we liaise with the locations department when someone breaks something. But I would say primarily it'd be, yeah, costume and makeup and camera a lot of time we we i always try and make a a a beeline for the the dop or the camera operator to be like i'm going to be on your shoulder a lot of the time going is that in shot is that in shot is that in shot is that bad is that bad and providing they're you know they've got the patience and you choose your opportunities when to talk to them nine times out of ten you'll be fine they're probably used to it as well exactly yeah it's it's a big part of their job is being asked what can you see um because it's their they are the eyeball of the production so yeah, I would say costume and makeup department we liaise with quite a lot, but then also the, the DOP and definitely the script supervisor. Anyone in charge of continuity, we are attached at the hip. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And it, it sounds strange. It's like finding out your, your best friend has got another best friend. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd never considered that costume angle, but you are, it yeah. makes complete sense. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, makes, yeah. makes sense why you've yeah. got a numerous times where people go like oh we're just going to pour some blood on this and you see like a costume girl <laughs> running towards a full tilt with like a suit bag over her shoulder and another like ikea bag full of stuff and they're like don't touch him <laughs> oh. instantly meg milton comes to my head god bless her um yeah so it's yeah liaising with the with the costume department a lot as well but we also try and that's why being approachable and talkative and positive is a great trait to have as a standby prop because a lot of departments, they stick to their own group. So the like lighting boys, like the whole Sparks department, they sort of stay in their own little lane and the gaffer is the one that talks to everyone. Whereas we have to liaise with so many different people. So you have to be approachable. You have to build up those professional relationships really early doors. Like I'm going into my first project in like six months and I'm going, right, this time on this job, on day one, I'm going around, I'm introducing myself to every single member of crew. And I'm be like, I'm going to try and learn your names and learn this name's 
to build up that reputation of like, oh, that's George. We can talk to him. Like he's someone that we can trust about X, Y, Z. So it means that, you know, if there is a problem early on, I haven't got to be like, oh, um, this is on fire. Also, I'm George of the standby department. Nice to meet you. Like it's building up that professional um, repertoire between you, uh, between you and the rest of the other teams. Yeah. And for locations, I, I've often done dailies work. So if mm-hmm. you come up to me and say, oh, I'm George and Props. And yeah. when my location manager goes, can you go ask Props this? And I'm like, I don't yeah. know who anyone is. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Just, that's when I got to the locations department. And it's just like, oh, if uh, I was like, oh, I'm George from the from the Props team. But if anything goes wrong, I'm Steve from Makeup. Like, it's just, <laughs> just call me something else because it's not going to be my fault, but it will end up always being Props' fault. But yeah, it's the nature of the beast. This has been absolutely amazing. Oh, it's been great. I've, I've loved it. I've never been on anything like this before. And it's really nice to be able to talk shop uh, mm. for the first time in a long time. Um, and we now know it's uh, not a kid in a candy shop. It's a props person in a props warehouse. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it so much. It's the best part about my job is that I get to say how much I love it all the time. A lot of other people in other departments are just like, oh, it's such a slog and all this <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, I love it. Every you time love the slog. I've, yeah. I've worked in this industry since I was... 24 I'm 32 now and still every single time I go on a film set like the hairs on the back of my neck go up and it crackles and I get to go this is my job like I've got friends that are engineers that like earn hundreds of thousands of pounds a year and they hate their job and I'm like I get to go up to Robson Green and be like you're right Robson how's your weekend like it's lovely it's such a a blessing to be able to do the job that I do like I come from a family of entirely medical background. My father was a doctor. My mum was a hospital liaison manager. My sister is a mental health nurse. Like, and I am confusing to them. <laughs> <laughs> but I get to be like, oh yeah, I've like worked with Tom Cruise and this, that and the other. Yeah. And they're just like, your job's mental. And I'm like, yeah. And I get paid to do this. It's mental. Are you an expert in medical props? Oh, I avoid it. <laughs> I avoid it so much. I worked very briefly on, um, this is going to hurt, the Adam K uh, biopic. And... That was very medically heavy. They had, but they will also employ for something that level. They'll employ a medical consultant on set, be it Adam K himself or there was a medical consultant. I think his name was Steve, and yeah, they would just teach you all that kind of stuff on set. But a lot of the time, it would go over to them. But yeah, I wouldn't call myself a, a medical expert. <laughs> I'll leave that to the on-set medic. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much. Yeah, Thanks, thank George. you. <laughs> Thanks, George. Oh, nice. <laughs>